This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Hello and welcome to You're Dead to Me from Radio 4, a comedy podcast that takes history seriously. My name is Greg Jenner, I'm a public historian, author and broadcaster, and I'm the chief nerd on the funny kids TV show Horrible Histories. And today we are jumping back to the 19th century to travel the world and tend to the sick and injured with the extraordinary businesswoman, traveller and healer Mary Seacole. And to help me do that, I am joined by two very special guests. In History Corner, she's the Paul Murray Kendall Chair in Biography and Professor of English at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. She's a renowned expert on the biographies of 19th century black people in the UK and USA and on interracial relationships. And she's a broadcaster, the author of many important books, including most recently Britain's Black Past, which became a 10-part radio series on the BBC, is Professor Gretchen Gazina. Welcome, Gretchen. Hello, Greg. It's so nice to be here. And in Comedy Corner, he's an award-winning comedian and writer. You may have seen him on Live at the Apollo, Mock the Week, Russell Howard's Good News, or caught him on BBC Radio 4's The Now Show, or his Radio 4 show Can't Tell Nathan Kate Nothing. And of course, you'll have heard him on our show, You're Dead to Me, where we did an episode on Notting Hill Carnival. It's the delightful Nathan Caton. Welcome back, Nathan. Hey, what's going on, mate? You all right? I'm good. Welcome back to the show. Last time we had you on, Nathan, you said that uh, history at school was not your thing. And I quote, you said it was... All right. Uh, not a ring and endorsement, but you know, okay. <laughs> Firstly, are you still feeling ambivalent to history? And secondly, have you heard of Mary Seacole? Does the name ring a bell? In regards to history, I mean, it's, it's still cool. I mean, it's, it's there. It's cool. It's all good. <laughs> and do I know who Mary Seacole is? Yes. Um, I know that she is the nurse of all nurses. And if she was alive during this pandemic, we would have been clapping for her. Not just, not just Thursday, but Monday to Sunday. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. She did quite a lot else as well. She's quite an extraordinary person. So, what do you know? This brings us to the first segment of the podcast, the So What Do You Know, where I have a go at guessing what you at home might know about today's subject. And I think, like Nathan, the name Mary Seacole is going to... Definitely rings some bells. She was a black British nurse in the 1800s, best known for treating soldiers during the Crimean War. You may have seen that she's had a statue erected recently outside St Thomas's Hospital in London. She's been the face of a first-class stamp. And there's a film coming out, and it stars Gugu Mbata Raw, a very talented actress, so hopefully it'll be a good movie. And of course, if you've heard our radio show for kids, Homeschool History, you'll know about Mary C. Cole there as well. But what else do we need to know, apart from her most famous Crimean activities? Let's find out, shall we? Professor Gretchen, Mary Seacole is not born Mary Seacole. Could you tell us about her childhood, please? Mary was born Mary Jane Grant in Kingston, in the colony of Jamaica, November 1805. Her father was James Grant, a Scottish lieutenant in the British Army. She had a sister called Eliza Grant and a half-brother named Edward Sadly, we don't know her mother's name, but we do know that she was a mixed-race Jamaican woman. At the time of Mary's birth, the West Indies was an outpost of the British Empire, so there was a large British military presence. So we don't know much about her mum. We'll just call her Mrs Grant. But we do know that Mrs Grant owns a pretty nice boarding house called Blundell Hall. It's one of the best boarding houses, best hotels really in Kingston in Jamaica. And... Mrs. Grant was known as a doctress. Nathan, do you know what a doctress might have been? Uh, a doctor with more class. <laughs> like really, really fancy hats. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you, you thought you had it good with a doctor, but a doctress. <laughs> <laughs> it's the waitress equivalent of medicine. It's just a little bit fancier. No, I think doctress, Gretchen, is an interesting term that I guess speaks to the Caribbean culture. Can you tell us more? Well, first of all, I think the name Doctoress should go the way of poetess, negress, <laughs> or any of those words that add the feminine ending. As a doctress, she practiced traditional African and Jamaican herbal medicine, which would have been seen as very different to the type of care provided by European doctors who would favor pills over the kinds of organic materials Mary's mother would have provided, such as flowers and roots. So Mary's mum is running a hotel, but also is a local healer. And Mary herself, young Mary, picks up her own healing skills, Nathan. How do you think she practices her skills as a young girl? I would guess on toys. If it was anything like me, 
I would have <laughs> tried on like Turtles action figures. Leonardo, he can fight again. <laughs> it's too late for Donatello. He's he's a goner. <laughs> yeah, Donatello's gone. Save yourself, Leo. Save yourself, Leo. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. She started by treating her dolls, her cats oh! and her dogs. She said in her memoir, whatever disease was most prevalent in Kingston, be sure my poor dolly soon contracted it. I mean, I'm guessing that's not how stand-up comedy works, right, Nathan? You didn't start by testing your material on your various toys. I actually started testing out my jokes on my mum, who uh, had the same facial expressions of <laughs> my toys after hearing my material. Just stone face, no emotion. <laughs> All right, so young Mary grew up in Blundell Hall, which is this respectable boarding house. She's practising healing. She's meeting military types, um, British army officers who are staying at the hotel. She's hearing their travel stories from around the world. She's having quite an interesting childhood. Is she getting any other formal education, Gretchen? She didn't go to school the way we might think of that today, but she did receive an education in the house of a patroness, another S word, who she (laughs) describes in her autobiography as a surrogate grandmother. She also learned how to run a hotel from her. So although it was against the law at the time for multiracial children of a white father to inherit or benefit legally from his estate, Mary was still a well-educated daughter of a Scottish officer and a mixed-race woman with a respectable business. Mary, as a teenager, she gets the travel bug quite young. Age 16, she's off on adventure. Where do you think this Jamaican teenager goes, Nathan? Gosh, at 16? Where do you you go when it's... If you're you're 16 years old in Jamaica, I mean, surely you just stay in Jamaica. I mean, (laughs) why why would you leave the Caribbean? (laughs) Just over the water, I'm going to guess America, New York, Miami, something like that. That's a good guess. That's certainly where I would have gone. But she went the other way. She went to London, age 16, and she travels by ship. Do you want to guess how long it takes to get there? I remember vaguely my grandma telling me, because she came from Antigua, uh, about a month to six weeks. Oh, that's not far off. This is a long time ago when ships are a bit ropey. But yeah, about eight to ten weeks, we reckon. So she's a 16-year-old young girl on a ship for well over probably two months. What was the voyage like, Gretchen? And how did Mary find London? Did she enjoy it? Well, first of all, I love traveling by ship and I've crossed the Atlantic seven times because I don't like (laughs) to fly. Oh, okay. It was not like that for Mary. (laughs) It was not comfortable. (laughs) Some passengers, particularly English women, seem to have found the journey very difficult and uncomfortable. Mary seemed to have enjoyed herself and arrived in London relatively safe and sound. It's a long time on a ship, Nathan. I mean, eight to ten weeks on a boat. I mean, yeah. there's only so many Sudoku. Imagine being 16 years old, eight to ten weeks on a ship with no Wi-Fi. How do you survive? <laughs> I guess you're doing a lot of selfies with seagulls, probably. <laughs> but she stayed for a year, enjoyed it, and she heads back aged 18. And this time she comes as a businesswoman. What do you reckon her business is? I mean, I would guess it's like local remedies from the Caribbean that she's bought. You are definitely in the right area. It's more Caribbean food. Oh, obviously, I should have guessed that. That's one thing we do well. Yeah, she becomes London's new exciting importer of West Indian pickles and preserves. So she's the pickle magnate. She shows up with jars and jars and jars of pickles. She's selling them to hotels, restaurants, friends. She makes quite good money. And she doesn't have a chaperone. She doesn't have a sponsor. She is an 18-year-old from the Caribbean. She's a mixed-race woman. And she's just shown up in London with her business. Quite commendable. She's full of bold confidence. She was basically the original human Shepherd's Bush market of her generation. <laughs> Maybe she founded it. Maybe that's why it's there now. <laughs> and Nathan, architecture is the thing you studied and then you went into comedy. But if I'd said to you, no, I need you to run a teenage business, what would your apprentice style business model have been? At 18 years old? Yeah. Probably something I cannot say on radio. Uh, 18 year old boy Um. so we've got mary grant returning to kingston in jamaica from london in early 1826 but on the voyage back nathan her ship catches fire and it's quite serious we don't swim as well (laughs) i'm not sure anyone swims that well on the atlantic it's quite a long way there is a point where they are weighing up whether to jump into the sea and hope to be rescued by another ship and mary cuts a deal with the ship's cook she pays him two pounds quite a lot of money and the idea is that if it comes to the abandoned ship he's going to tie her to a wooden chicken coop and chuck her over the side in the hope that it floats there's a certain resourcefulness even in a crisis that you've got to admire I'm not sure i'd think that through but if that was me i'd just be like 
screaming and praying to God as I'm jumping in the water. <laughs> I'm not trying to, ooh, just trying to negotiate a deal, some safety. <laughs> I wouldn't have the, the composure to do that. But just The haggling can only last so long, can't they? Because the fires are getting bigger and bigger. Yeah, exactly. It's like, hurry up, it's getting warmer, hurry up. Well, the ship did not sink. They managed to extinguish the fire, so she didn't have to jump into the sea attached to a chicken coop. But back in Jamaica, Mary returns to working with her mother, Mrs. Grant, in the hotel. But Gretchen... She meets a fella and she falls in love. And this is Mr. Seacole. Do you want to tell us about Edwin Horatio Seacole? It's quite a handle, that name. 10th of November in 1836, Mary Grant, as she was, married Edwin Horatio Hamilton Seacole. Edwin was an English merchant and he would have been quite unusual for an interracial couple to marry. Early on in their marriage, Edwin and Mary tried unsuccessfully to run a general store but they ended up moving back to Blundell Hall. He wasn't well, however, and she had to look after him quite a lot. There's rumours that he is the kind of illegitimate child of Lord Nelson, hence the name Horatio. We're not sure if that's true, but he seems to have a connection, maybe. But yeah, Edwin is not very well. He's very poorly, and unfortunately, tragedy soon strikes. In fact, Gretchen, it's a triple tragedy for Mary. She has some really bad luck. Yeah, poor Mary. Sadly, um, Blundell Hall burnt down in 1843, and then her husband and mother both died in 1844. And in the midst of all this tragedy, Mary, now Seacole, kept herself busy and rebuilt the hotel better than before, she says. She took charge of the establishment and apparently turned down lots of marriage proposals. Yeah, she doesn't need any fellas. <laughs> As you're saying that, in my head, I had Destiny's Child and Beyonce. <laughs> oh, my way, man, who's independent. Throw your hands up at me. <laughs> they do, obviously, rebuild the hotel. What do you think they call the new hotel? Well, it's got to be Edwin Hall. Oh, that's nice. That's a very sweet gesture, Nathan. You clearly are showing a real romantic <laughs> heart there. No, she went with new Blundell Hall. Better than before. New improved recipe. So new Blundell Hall rises from the ashes. The really interesting moment in her medical career, I don't know if medical's quite the word, but let's say healing career, is in 1850. We get a cholera outbreak on Jamaica. And it's really serious, isn't it, Gretchen? Yeah, it killed 32,000 Jamaicans. She hadn't witnessed the disease before, and how cholera spread was not yet fully understood. There were two views. Some people thought that it went person-to-person -person contact, and the other view was that it passed through the miasma, sort of in the air. Mary believed that it was spread by person-to-person -person contact, and she couldn't do much for people, but she tried her best to help them. Yeah. So in 1850, she is 45 years old, trying to help people in the middle of this really dangerous outbreak. But the following year that cholera goes away, in 1851, she's a bit bored, right? She's been to London, she's travelled, she's survived a shipwreck almost, you know, she's <laughs> lived through a cholera epidemic. She's like, ah, life is a little bit samey. So she's off to go and visit her half-brother, Edward. He has had this maverick idea of setting up a hotel and general store in Cruces in Panama, so you said before, Nathan, heading to America. This is Central America. Gretchen, let's be uh, generous here and say that he's, you know, it's a start-up business. It's not necessarily that luxurious, but it's a bit shambolic when she arrives, isn't it? I don't think that she was expecting how bad it was, but I'll be kind to him. But she and her <laughs> maid had to sleep under the dining room table in a makeshift tent while her brother and the other staff slept on top of the table <laughs> while she was there. <laughs> A friend of her brother's mysteriously died after eating at the hotel one night. It was assumed that he had been poisoned, but Mary asked to examine the body and discovered that he had died of cholera. By lunchtime the next day, another man had also died, and Mary immediately started treating him with mustard and calomel, or mercuric chloride, to blister him, and he lived. I'm not sure which was worse. <laughs> yeah, there's some fairly strong remedies here that Mary's using. So the first thing to say here, Nathan, is that Cruz says it's a smallish town, but it's a point where travellers stop off. They're trying to get through Panama to go to California. The Dubai of Central America. <laughs> not quite as luxuriously uh, appointed with hotels, I don't think. <laughs> Basically, I mean, people are trying to get to the California gold rush, and one of the quickest routes is down through Panama. So you've got a lot of people traveling. It's not a very well-resourced town. And Mary, very quickly, they spot that she's like the only person who knows what they're doing in terms of medicine. So she's the town's best hope. And so she starts treating people. 
She treats the poor for free and she charges the wealthy. How do you feel about that, Nathan? Oh, she's the right person of the people, isn't she? Right. <laughs> Keir Starmer, Jeremy Corbyn, eat your heart out. That's how you look after the people. <laughs> she sounds like everyone's mum. It's lovely. <laughs> well, later on in the episode, you'll hear exactly that's how people thought of her. Gretchen, Mary Seacole has seen cholera before. But we, at this point in history, don't really have medical knowledge of how cholera works. There's no germ theory quite yet. So how does Mary know how to treat this? Or is she just figuring it out by going, well, not that, not this. I've only got this in my bag. What's her process? Yeah, her training was in traditional medicine and healing. But she had a lot of intellectual curiosity and had secretly performed an autopsy to learn more information about the disease. And in truth, some of her cures um, were probably not helpful. But she was trying her best. Cinnamon water probably helped rehydrate some patients. Many of her patients died, but some lived. And then she also contracted cholera herself and had to rest for several weeks. This would have been really unpleasant, but she did recover, which meant she now had firsthand experience of what the disease actually felt like and made her even more empathetic to the victims and those who are still suffering. Nathan, she gets cholera. It's not the sniffles here. This is a lethal disease that's killed 30,000 in Jamaica. It's pretty serious. Listen, I know how I am when I get man flu, so I can only imagine. (laughs) She didn't have the same education that, you know, we might have now, but was she strong in a scientific field? Like, I'm guessing you have to be pretty smart with sciences to, you know, work out what medicines to use for stuff. Many of the medicines we have today were all derived from the kinds of things that Mary Haddon was doing. So she has some knowledge of how these things work and what to do with them and and what to use to treat certain things. Yeah, and she does, by the sound of it, save some people. And of course, she survives, which is uh, be a very short podcast if she didn't. <laughs> Mary has basically spotted a gap in the market. So what do you think she does next, Nathan? It depends what the gap is. It's, well, it's got to be the cure for, for cholera. Because no one else has got that. <laughs> no, she basically tries to open her own hotel across the road from her brothers. I don't know if they're in competition. That's pretty harsh if they are. It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <So> Addy Dassler. <laughs> it's <brought> all over again. <laughs> she opens a business called The British Hotel. And it's a restaurant. It has only two rooms. So it's not really a hotel at all, actually. And she can fit 50 diners in. So it's a sort of canteen it's nice but she's also got a luxury service that she added a barber's service there's a barber called jose you can get your hair cut in the back so you can get a trim obviously she'd had blundell hall new blundell hall so surely she should have called it new new blundell hall but you know. blundell hall 3.0 <laughs> so this one's called the british hotel barber's service in the back gate what would your hotel be called nathan and also what luxury service would you offer in your establishment okay i'll be really immature i would call my hotel your mum's house <laughs> that's nice yeah just so i can hear people go where are you staying tonight i'm staying at your mum's house <laughs> that's the kind of immature person i am but i could get a coupon for your mum's house and then, yeah, exactly. and then Mate, yeah. sending little, little keychains i was at your mum's house last night you know on the keychain um but what's the service you'd offer as the i'm hopefully not anything related to your mum's house i mean no, no, I'm mad. I'm back away from that question now. <laughs> uh, no okay my luxury service my girlfriend says i get a good uh, shoulder massage so oh, I would, yeah i would i would offer a uh, nice relaxing shoulder massage all right well i'm definitely checking in to your mum's house so. <laughs> <laughs> so mary has set up a new business in cruces in panama and her life is full of drama and danger. There's quite a lot of violence in Cruces. There's a couple of women who get in a punch-up and then steal her stuff. There's a man who pulls a knife on her when he's trying to burgle her. People have guns. This is not necessarily the ideal place for a widow in her mid-40s running a business. And the other question, I suppose, Gretchen, is the question of her race, right? So she has three white grandparents. She's mixed race. But she is encountering racial prejudice. She's a woman of colour and she is facing racism. Yeah, she described herself as a yellow woman. And as you mentioned, three of her grandparents were white, but she regularly faced racism. And she recalled an American gentleman praising her for all the healing she had done during the cholera epidemic, but then commiserating with her that God had neither seen fit to make her an American nor fully white, so she might be accepted in any company as she deserves to be how do you think that went down with mary nathan well if she's anything like me i would have prayed that he got cholera and just watched him slowly suffer <laughs> okay you want my help now huh 
I guess not a milk to give it to you. <laughs> I mean, she's not quite as brutal as that. She responds with quite a nice burn, actually. She says, as to the society which the process of bleaching my skin might gain me admission to, all I can say is that judging from the specimens I have met with here and elsewhere, I don't think that I shall lose much by being excluded from it. So, gentlemen, I drink to you and the general reformation of American manners. That was her way of saying, your mum. <laughs> Not your hotel, but yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so in true Mary Seacole fashion, she's off again in 1852. She's moving. Where's she going this time? In 1852, Mary moved to Gorgona, which I hope I pronounced correctly, which is an island off the Pacific coast of Colombia. She built and briefly ran a females only hotel. But then she returned to Jamaica in the same year as that was not very lucrative possibly because the only sort of clientele she hoped to attract, i.e. American women, would rather stay in an American hotel than one run by a mixed-race person. And in fact, when she tried to get a ship home to Jamaica, she was racially abused by some passengers and then had to wait for another ship in order to get home. Gretchen, you're an expert on interracial marriages and and mixed relationships in the 19th century. And Mary Seacole is an interesting figure in that regard in that she is mixed race. She has three white grandparents, but of course she's perceived slightly differently by Americans than by Brits and by herself. Is that a common thing in this period? Yeah, in fact, I was thinking through some earlier things and almost all the difficulties that we have in letters and things come from Americans who don't approve. So for instance, Dido, Elizabeth Bell was in the film. Her uncle, where she lived, her great uncle, He had American guests coming to stay, and they would say terrible things about her. And they just couldn't understand why he would have a woman like her in his house, even though she was related to him. So Americans, first of all, had made interracial marriage illegal. It wasn't illegal in Britain. So yeah, I think the Americans could be very rough on people like Mary. And when Mary visited London when she was a teenager, she came with a friend, and her friend was exposed to more racism than Mary was. So she's a complicated character in that way because in her memoirs, Mary sometimes wants to be part of the British Empire and sometimes she's very proud of her Creole heritage. So in some ways she was negotiating how people perceived her and trying not to be discriminated against. This is a sad part of her memoir where she's racially abused and doesn't want to get on a boat. But she never stops, of course, and she goes back to Jamaica, Nathan, of course, and this time... There is another outbreak of disease. This time it's yellow fever. And she's working at the military hospital, which is called Up Park Camp. And she is hiring local nurses. Uh, She's treating the officers and their families in her hotel, New Blundell Hall. Again, frontline nursing. And she's trusted by the British Army. She's very brave, I think, in a lot of ways. I kind of feel like um, sorry for her in a sense. And that like she she comes back to Jamaica, then there's a yellow fever outbreak. Surely there must have been a point where she's thinking... Oh, can't a girl just catch a break? It's Jamaica. I just want to chill out. I'm going to go to the beach. Can't, can't <laughs> a girl just rest, please? The 19th century Caribbean was a dangerous place. There were unfortunately a lot of tropical diseases. But yeah, she's working her socks off, trying to save lives. But then in 1854, she moves again. This time, Nathan, where do you think she's going now? <laughs> okay, where hasn't she been? Uh, is it straight? No, straight. That's too far. I mean, that's that's like a, a year on a ship, isn't it? Okay, I'm gonna say. <laughs> Let's go Central Europe. Oh, it's a nice guess. No, she goes to Central America again, but a different part of Central America. She goes and joins up at a gold mining company in New Granada, which is, I think, maybe Colombia. And this time she's not helping her brother out, Edward. She's instead helping out another person who's connected to her husband. This guy's called Thomas Day, Gretchen. Can you tell us a bit more? Yeah, he was, as you said, a relative of her late husband. And there, in New Granada, she provided care and probably cooked as well for the company's staff. And she remembered taking a lot of walks, kicking rocks to see if she could find a piece of gold. She only (laughs) ever found fool's gold. You didn't find it usually lying around on the path. And it's around this time she heard about the Crimean War. I think gold mining, generally speaking, you have to do some digging. You can't just... (laughs) 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 I mean, that's how I do gold mining. I just sort of shuffle around going, any gold? No, all right, (laughs) I'll just go. (laughs) But yeah, this is where she hears about the Crimean War, which is looming on the horizon. It hasn't quite broken out yet. Nathan, do you know anything about the Crimean War? I know that the Crimean War was between the 
British forces and the Russian allegiance. So that's all I know. That's pretty good knowledge, to be honest. Yeah, it's quite a complicated war, and I won't bore you with it, but it's British, French, Sardinian, and Turkish alliance versus the Russian Empire. And it all starts in the region we call the Crimea, which is on the Black Sea coast near Ukraine. So a long way away, Russian expansion has basically brought Britain and France into the war. Britain and France used to be enemies, and now they're on the same side, which is quite awkward. And Mary reads a newspaper report that this war is coming. She gets on the ship and heads to London. Obviously, it takes her weeks to get there. It's a really bold thing to do, but I suppose... If you think about it, she loves soldiers. Her dad was in the military. She spent all this time growing up with soldiers in the hotel. There have been British regiments stationed in her hotel, you know, and staying with her during outbreaks of disease. And she says that she feels maternal instinct, Nathan. She feels like their mum. She wants to go and make sure they're okay. I mean, you could almost say she's like too brave for her own good or too caring for her own good. That like most people would stay away from an area of war. But especially if you're in, if you're in Jamaica... And someone's all well, in Colombia. And so it's, oh, there's a war. Where? On the other side of the world. You'd be like, okay, good for them. Another drink, please. You'd be like, I'm going to get on a ship and head in that direction. Yeah, and she runs towards danger. Mary Seacole arrives in Southampton on October 18th, 1854. When she gets off the ship, she's handed a newspaper. And the British Army has already fought a major battle at a place called Alma. And already things have gone horribly wrong. I mean, Nathan, I don't know... You know, if you know about the Crimean War's reputation, but it's no. one of the sort of disastrous wars in British history. It, it starts terribly for the Brits. They haven't got enough supplies and tents and shoes and, you know, the soldiers are freezing to death. There's not enough food. The disease breaks out. The hospitals are overwhelmed. There's not enough doctors and nurses. It's an absolute crisis. It actually brings down the British Prime Minister. So Britain you know. not having supplies. Britain, Britain a bit overwhelmed. <laughs> Where have we heard of that before? <laughs> <laughs> completely unrelated to contemporary <laughs> history um, happening right now yeah the british prime minister is brought down with the crimean war it's an absolute scandal the most famous nurse obviously that people listening will know is florence nightingale and florence is literally about to leave with her first team of nurses when mary seacole arrives so three days later florence is off gretchen in her autobiography which is a brilliant read listeners i absolutely uh, recommend it. it's really good fun mary tells us that she tries to join Florence Nightingale's nursing team, the second wave. And so she sort of rocks up to Whitehall in London and knocks on the door of the war office and goes, hello, I'm Mary Seacole, and goes, I'm a doctress. I've worked in a gold mine. I'm a nurse. I've helped the British Army. I can help. And they say, who are you, go away? What do we know about this encounter, Gretchen? Is it that straightforward? Well, she arrives fully believing that just by being herself and offering her services and handing over some letters of recommendation or her CV or whatever she had at the time, that they would be thrilled to have her. But instead, they were shunting her around from the war office to the medical office, and no luck. She tried to appeal to the Secretary of War's wife, Elizabeth Herbert, but she told Mary that all the positions were filled. But really, other women Mary's age had been deemed too old, Mary later asked in her memoir whether her skin color was to blame for the rejections because in London, nobody believed a Creole woman could be an accomplished nurse or a doctress. And it was the first time in her life that she found herself not valued at all. This is a sort of tricky point for historians with Mary Seacole because there's no evidence of her applying for these jobs, right? We don't have any forms, any documents. There's no sort of CV she handed in, which doesn't mean that it didn't happen. So it might be that she sort of, you know, just showed up as, assuming that she'd just be put on the boat and they were like, well, there's an pr- official process and you've, you're too late. But the interesting thing about Mary Seacole is that we don't have any evidence for her other than what she says about herself until she gets to the Crimea. Her whole life up to this point, aged 49 or so, is... Mary's word and I'm happy to take her word but like it's kind of fascinating we don't have quite a lot of stuff that can back up her her tales we just have to go with her memoirs have you checked her LinkedIn page (laughs) I haven't yeah that's that's a good idea (laughs) (laughs) she also says she applies for the Crimean Fund which is a public fundraiser again apparently she's turned down Nathan hearing what you've heard so far about Mary Seacole, how do you feel she takes these knockbacks? Oh, I, I have no doubt that she had that mentality, whatever doesn't kill you just makes you stronger, you know? Um, and she just brushed it off her shoulder, carried on going. You're absolutely right. So what is the plan B option, Gretchen? She always seems to have another plan up her sleeve or another way to get around doing what she wants to do. So after all these rejections, she decides to fund herself. 
She goes back to Thomas Day, her husband's relative, and collaborates with him to set up another business, this time in the Crimea. She gets business cards printed and boards a steamer for Constantinople. And when she arrives, she meets a Turkish officer who helps her set up a supply chain. She then goes to Florence Nightingale's hospital at Scutari, briefly meets her, and then heads across the sea to the Crimea itself, arriving four days later at the harbor in the middle of a war zone, ready to start another business. <laughs> I mean, it's great, isn't it, Nathan? He's like, I'll just head into the war zone then. <laughs> yeah, to, to start a business. Not, you could have done that in Jamaica in peace and quiet. <laughs> I do really want to see this episode of The Apprentice. Well, my business model is I'm going to go to a very dangerous place. I'm out. <laughs> I haven't finished yet. <laughs> no, yeah. I, just heard, I heard war um, zone and I'm out. <laughs> this is literally a war zone. This is literally front lines. And the business model, it's a sort of canteen shop. It's a sort of restaurant of sorts. It's a bit like what she did in Panama. And so they eventually settle in a village called Cadicoy, about uh, three, four miles from the battlefield and near the, the besieged city of Sebastopol, which is this Russian-held city that the British are besieging, the French and British and Turkish and Sardinians. And of course, she's got to start a new business. So uh, she's sent out the business cards in advance so people know she's coming. And what do you think their business is called, Nathan? The British Blundell business. <laughs> nice. Squeeze them all in. Yeah, she goes for the simpler option of the British Hotel Mark II, I guess. So again, the name British Hotel suggests class, suggests a high caliber building. I mean, you studied architecture, Nathan. What kind of materials would you be looking to build your fancy hotel from? Marble, lots of like pillars, like, you know, like ancient Greek style um, inspired architecture. So your mum's house is, is marble. That's the look. That's the vibe. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mary Seacole didn't have marble, not really available in the war zone. She had driftwood, basically. She has random bits of wood she pulls out of the sea, bits of corrugated metal. She finds some window bits. It's a shack, right? She builds a shack. She gets a bit of help from the local Turkish commander. She calls him the Pasha. He lends a few blokes. She picks up some Brits as well, a couple of carpenters, and they just basically assemble this shack four miles on the battlefield. And she calls it the British Hotel. I mean, Gretchen, it's not a hotel. No one can stay overnight. Um, there's no room service. So what is the business model in the Crimea for Mary Seacole? I have to say that I love that she calls this place a hotel. I'm not even convinced it had a front door. Um, <laughs> she was a, a sutler, which means that she sold provisions to the ordinary troops and then ran a canteen. But for the rich officers, she gave more of a restaurant kind of service. The Turkish Pasha that she calls him in the book was a regular guest, and he offered Mary his help in exchange for teaching him English, and that didn't go so great. Apparently, after two years, all he had learned to say was her name and how to say, gentlemen, good morning and more champagne. <laughs> Other guests included the French celebrity chef Alexis Soyer, or Soyer. They were also keen tourists who wanted to see the war up close, so they would go stay, eat there and look at the war while they were eating. So the hotel seems to have had some quality customers. She hired two black cooks, but she also cooked herself. In the autobiography, she talks about the fact that whenever I had a few leisure moments, I used to wash my hands, roll up my sleeve, and roll out pastry. Her milkless rice pudding was famous, as was her sausage and mash. So it's kind of basic food that she's serving. If I was served that, I would not complain. I'd be like, yo, it's free food. It's good. I'm taking it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love the fact that the Turkish Pasha learned two phrases, morning gentlemen and more champagne. That's all you need, right? That's yeah, exactly. he, he can come to Britain. He'd get by on that easily. <laughs> be everyone's friend. He'd be fine in Westminster. He'd probably be <laughs> in sort of back then champagne. Exactly. The British Hotel is not especially glamorous, really. You said, Gretchen, she hires a couple of black cooks. We know she's working with local Greek people she picks up as, as servants. She calls them Johnnies. She can't learn any of their names. She calls them all just Johnnies. Uh, you, you're a Johnny. You'll be a Johnny. You, also a Johnny. She has 
a lot of problems, Nathan. She's got supply issues. She's got rats running around. There are people stealing stuff of her all the time. It's a war zone. So, like, literally, you know, there are shells going off, people dying and people stumbling in covered in blood. And I suppose, really, that brings us then on to the thing that you knew about her, Nathan, the nursing, right? We've heard her, you know, dealing with cholera and, and yellow fever and so on. But it's the Crimean nursing that has made her famous first in the 19th century and then, of course, to modern school kids and, and many of our listeners. So, Gretchen... What kind of nursing are we talking here? She's not Florence Nightingale. Is she? She's not setting up beds and, and, you know, with a clipboard and administration. It's more maternal. Is that right? Yeah, she really was one of those people who liked to give and to receive a bit of love and care. She bandaged men at the docks. She served tea to those who were waiting for the hospital ships that were heading back to Turkey. And sometimes she ventured even onto the battlefield to treat the walking wounded She was also often on hand with remedies for those who had bad stomachs or illnesses that didn't really need hospital treatment. She wasn't a nursing pioneer, as you said, like Florence Nightingale, who reformed the profession, but she was really doing hands-on actual nursing. She's running a business and nursing is sort of what she does in her spare time. She's making her money from the offices, Nathan. That's the business model is charge the offices good prices for champagne and good food. And then in the spare time, helping out with the general soldiers. I've got uh, just this, this lovely image of her, like just just like wandering onto the battlefield, going, "Guys, time out! I know you guys are fighting, but I've got some tea. You want tea?" <laughs> <laughs> She used to wear a very bright yellow dress, so it's not as if she was camouflaged in the middle of battle. (laughs) You'd see her coming from a long way off. But she would also be serving tourists. So tourists actually travelled to the Crimea to watch a war. What? Yeah, they would sit on a hill called Cathcart's Hill and they would watch battles happen and they'd have their picnic and their sandwiches. And so Mary Seacole would come and bring them their food. Who? Who? (laughs) <laughs> on earth is traveling to i mean okay credit to the travel agent who sold that package <laughs> <laughs> yeah. who's traveling to yeah. a war for you? <laughs> what did you do for your summer holidays i went and watched the war it was great it also happened in the american civil war and it was very popular to go out to all those battlefields and bring your picnic lunch and bring the children to watch people shooting at each other and having bayonets and things so it makes you wonder if the 19th century was just one of those things where kind of like Roman gladiators, you know, they, they like to sit back and, and watch the show. It's extraordinary now, isn't it, to think about it. But the Crimean War is quite a weird war, Nathan. I mean, it's chaotic. And in the middle of it is this middle-aged widow from Jamaica with a presumably a Caribbean accent, serving tea, making bangers and mash, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, entertaining the troops. She's, you know, she's warm and, and fun. Do you want to guess what the troops call her? Mummy Seacole. Yeah, Mother Seacole. Yeah. There yeah, you go. Oh, cool. Mother Seacole or Auntie Seacole as well sometimes. After a little while, she starts appearing in newspapers and magazines and journals back in the UK. William Howard Russell, first ever war correspondent, met her a few times and wrote in the Times that Mary was a warm and successful physician who doctors and cures all manner of men with extraordinary success. She is always in attendance near the battlefield to aid the wounded and has earned many a poor fellow's blessing. So she's getting right up in the times, which is pretty good. We're going to quickly show you just an image, Nathan. This is one of the first images that um, we get of Mary Seacole in British journalism. This is her in Punch magazine. Nathan, do you want to describe this image for us? It looks like, I'm guessing that that is Mary Seacole, and she's looking after an injured soldier who's lying in a bed. And she's, is that a... A magazine or something? Yeah, she's holding a copy of Punch magazine. Yeah. <laughs> ah, okay. Which was, I guess, and that's what she's given out to the soldiers to read while they're in bed. Yeah, and this cartoon is published in Punch magazine. So basically, they've used it as a branding exercise to say, Mary Seacole supports Punch magazine. But you can see there, there she's wearing that cape. Uh, she's sort of got a bonnet up over her head. It's quite a distinctive look. It's a superhero look. <laughs> yeah. People are starting to think of her as a Crimean heroine. We've talked about the Crimean War as being shambolic and so on, but gradually the British do get their act together. In 1856, Sevastopol, this Russian-held city, does fall. The Russians are defeated. And Mary's the first woman into the city. She has a bet with some French soldiers and she races in to be the first woman in. It's absolutely decimated, burning rubble and so on. In some ways, the moment where the war sort of ends is like the high point of her business model because she's got all these soldiers who aren't being shot at anymore. So they're happy and they've got money and they're buying stuff off her and the war is sort of over, but the negotiations for the peace treaty are happening. 
Then the war really is over and the soldiers go home. What do you think this means for Mary Seacole, Nathan? I would say that means that maybe she moves to London to, you know, now that she's got a following there, you know, everyone's like, oh, who's this Mother Seacole? She goes there and then she continues doing what she, what she was doing in Crimea in the UK. That's a great guess. Unfortunately, she has a slight money worry. Gretchen... She's ruined by the Crimean War, isn't she? A lot of the, the British soldiers left the Crimea and they had all these unpaid debts to her that she could no longer collect. And she had invested a lot of money in luxurious stocks that she couldn't sell. And she didn't want the Russians to have it. So she was one of the last to leave Crimea and it took her months to get home. She was declared bankrupt by a London court because of all the debts she would had to incur taking care of all these men. So she'd had all these guys in her hotel, and women too, and she'd been selling them champagne and food and bangers and mash, but she'd been too nice to ask for them to pay. She'd been doing IOUs and whatever. And then they were all like, bye, Mary, thanks so much. Bye, bye, bye. And she just didn't have the cash. So yeah, she gets home months later and and she's bankrupted. She and Thomas Day. She spent so much time with British people that she developed British mannerisms and was too polite to ask. (laughs) But she is a celebrity now. She is a war hero. And she does get back on her feet. How do you think this happens, Nathan? Okay, I'm going to just guess off history that another war broke out and she went there. It worked once, let's do it again. Actually, a really, really good guess. Not the answer I was looking for, but there is the Indian Rebellion of 1857, which she tries to go and join. This doesn't quite work out. No, there's a big fundraiser for her. There's a crowdfunder and everyone's like, hey, Mary Seacole. She's cool. Let's help her out. Gretchen, can we hear some more about this surge of popular support? She was already known because of the British press. And then they reported her financial troubles and a fund was set up. A poem was composed in her honour called A Stir for Sea Coal, set to the tune of Old King Coal. From 27 July to 30 July 1857, there was the Sea Coal Fund Grand Military Festival a fundraiser that coincided with the launch of her memoir, The Wonderful Adventures of Mrs. Seacole in Many Lands. More than 1,000 artists performed, including 11 military bands and an orchestra, and 40,000 people paid to attend it. 40,000 punters pay to come to this big Mary Seacole Fund Grand Military Festival. 1,000 artists, 11 military bands and an orchestra. How much money do you think she makes from this? First of all, that is a great gig. I would love to be booked on that. I'm guessing in that time, like, it would be, let's say, 10,000, which is probably, like, close to a million in today's day and age. You think she she earns a a ton of cash? I would hope so. Given everything that she's done, you would hope. You're going to tell me that it was, like, she got two quid and a packet of crisps. (laughs) 57 pounds is what she gets out of it, (laughs) The people who are running it are either corrupt or chaotic in their business dealings. And months and months and months go on and she's still not being paid a penny. And eventually she gets 57 quid. So it's pretty bad, isn't it? But as Gretchen mentioned, the memoir sells quite well. The first run sells out. It gets reprinted, which is pretty good. So the festival is sort of like the fire festival of the 1850s. It's a sort of... (laughs) 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 Sounds glamorous, but unfortunately, everyone gets screwed. But the memoir is called The Wonderful Adventures of Mrs. Seacole in Many Lands. It's a great book. You can read it for free online. I mean, what's your autobiography going to be called, Nathan? Probably like um, The uh, Professional Disappointment. (laughs) <laughs> a boy who could have been a successful architect and chose to be a clown that sounds more like a novel i like that that's nice mary c cole and florence nightingale are the two celebrity nurses that come out of the war and they're really different in their reaction to fame florence nightingale hates being famous because she's an aristocrat she's posh she thinks it's vulgar and crass and beneath her how do you think mary reacts nathan i think she lapped it up i think she would have been like <laughs> the usain bolt of her generation and just like <laughs> like a natural star in the public spot on i think she loves being famous she loves being celebrated i think also gretchen is it fair to say she likes being accepted she's you know a woman from the edge of empire she's a woman of color and she has been welcomed into the bosom of the empire That's a great way to put it. First of all, she's had the biggest book launch I've ever heard of, 40,000 people. But yes, I think she loved it. She got a lot of new patrons, and they included Queen Victoria, the Prince of Wales, the Duke of Edinburgh, the Duke of Cambridge, and a lot of senior military officers. The fund just kept growing, and Mary, 
was able to buy land in Kingston near New Blundell Hall, where she built herself a bungalow and larger property that she rented out because it was another business opportunity. She's always running businesses, that woman. (laughs) There's a lot of her life that happens after the Crimean, but, you know, this is where she sort of enjoys being famous a bit. There's also a painting of her, Nathan, that's it's quite a famous painting where she's seen wearing medals. Uh, one French, one British, one Turkish, maybe. And uh, we're not quite sure where she gets them from. <laughs> so, <laughs> again, <laughs> again, with historians not having enough evidence sometimes, we don't know if she was, like, given them by the Turkish government or the French government or if she just sort of thought, well, I deserve these, I'm going to wear them. So. There's four soldiers who will walk around going, has anyone seen my last, my last, has anyone seen it, guys? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I suspect that she probably was gifted them, but maybe we, we don't have the record. But yeah, this is something the historians have argued about quite a lot. We've kind of gone, hang on a minute, there's no paperwork. <laughs> <laughs> She's you know, quite proudly wearing them in her paintings. But fair enough, she's done a lot of stuff. She ha- does have these high-flying supporters, uh, and certainly by 1867, she has to go back to the Seacole Fund for a second time. And this time, she does get a bit more money off it. You know, Queen Victoria is a supporter. But again, 1870, there's a new war that kicks off. Mary's 65. It's the Franco-Prussian War. So the Prussians have invaded France. And again, she's like, I can help. I'm around. I've got experience. (laughs) It doesn't quite work out. So what do we know about the end of Mary's life, Gretchen? Is she comfortable? Well, she's back in London. And this does actually have a happy ending. In the last years of her life, she was a royal favourite. She may have been the personal masseuse of the Princess of Wales, Alexandra who suffered with white leg and rheumatism. Mary died a comfortably rich woman in 1881 at her house in Paddington, age 76. That's quite rare for us on this podcast, Nathan. We quite often have these sort of extraordinary people whose life is glamorous and fun and and, and important, and then they end up dying in poverty and forgotten. But here we have a woman who is hobnobbing with princesses and dies in her fancy house with some cash in the bank. You kind of feel like she kind of deserves it, you know? After after everything she's done, it's like, okay, she she went out (laughs) smiling, you know what I mean? How do you feel about Mary now? You've heard everything, Nathan, in terms of her life. What's your takeaway? I still think she's like everyone's mum, someone that you (laughs) you can't hate her. She's warm, she's caring, you can't help but just warm to her. Mary Seacole is one of my favourite people from history because... By the sounds of it, she was just a big, warm, smiley, fun, slightly pushy woman who just appeared in your house (laughs) and went, hello, I'm here to make things better. We could do more of that now. So, uh, yeah, I'm a big fan of hers. I think she's great. The nuance window! That brings us to the nuance window. This is where we allow our expert, Professor Gretchen, to have two minutes to tell us anything that we need to know related to today's episode. So Nathan and I will uh, pull up a pew in the British Hotel. We'll have some bangers and mash. We'll drink some champagne. (laughs) And so, uh, Gretchen, you have two minutes. And without much further ado, the nuance window, please. You know, what fascinates me about her is not just the story and the way she wrote it, because, of course, people can say whatever they want in their memoirs. But the fact that her reputation has lasted and that we're still talking about her now, she's been taken up. She's studied in universities. She has buildings named after her, the Health Center at Brunel University, the Mary Seacole Health Center in London. The building where she lived is sadly no longer there, but it is known and we can find where she lived and the kind of life she had. So I love the fact that her legacy has endured And she has become a kind of beacon for people who want to think about what a black woman could be or a mixed race woman could be at that time. And despite all of the challenges she faced in terms of race, in terms of money, in terms of profession, that she seemed to ultimately overcome them all. And she's been taken as a kind of role model for so many of us now. And it's well-deserved and it's kind of exciting to see that. We don't have to go past that time to say, ah, this may be a turning point in the way black women might have been seen in Britain by just the example that she had and how much the press wrote about her. So I'm wonderful. I think that we're still talking about her today. It's it's terrific. Thank you so much. Nathan, any thoughts on that? I didn't know that she was on stamps. I didn't, but then I probably figured it's probably because I haven't sent a letter in like two decades. So Stamps, what are they? (laughs) Big up Mary Seacole, that's what I'll say. So what do you know now? (laughs) 
So let's now see how much of this life our comedian Nathan Caton can remember. It's time for the quickfire quiz. The, so what do you know now? Uh, Nathan, last time out, you got 10 out of 10 in your quiz. You nailed it on the Notting Hill. So how are you feeling with the Mary Seacole quiz? Are you confident? Oh, no, I'm not confident at all. <laughs> what was her name again? <laughs> You've forgotten it. Okay, here we go. Question one. Mary Seacole was born in 1805, but what was her maiden name? Mary Grant. It was Mary Grant. Yes. Question two. Mary Seacole acquired nursing skills at her mother's boarding house in Jamaica. What was it called? Uh, the boarding house was called Blundell House. Yeah, Blundell Hall. Yeah, I'll let you have that. Question three. According to Seacole's autobiography, as a child, she practised her nursing skills on what guinea pigs? Oh, her toys. She, she practised on her, her dolls. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Her dolls, her cats and dogs. Yes. Question four. Who did Mary Seacole marry? She married Edwin Horatio Seacole. Very good. Edwin Horatio Hamilton Seacole. Question five. In 1850, Seacole nursed patients during an epidemic of which disease, which she later contracted herself? The disease in question is cholera. It is cholera. Question six. Uh, Mary Seacole travelled to which country to help her half-brother open a general store and hotel? Uh, she travelled to Panama. It was Panama. You're doing very well. Question seven. Mary Seacole raised her own funds and travelled to which war to open a supply canteen and care for soldiers? Oh, she travelled to the um, Crimean War. It is Crimean War. Question eight. What was the name of Seacole's driftwood shack set up in the Crimea with the help of the Turkish Pasha and his men? The British Hotel or British Hotel 2.0 reboot? <laughs> it was. Question nine. Seacole was in great financial difficulty when she returned to England after Crimea. How many people paid to go to her fundraising concert in 1857? Oh, uh, I remember this because I'm jealous. 40,000 people paid for her event. And this for a perfect run. What is the name of Mary Seacole's autobiography? Oh, he's falling at the last hurdle. <laughs> um, Any other words coming back to you? And times of Mary Seacole. <laughs> oh, no. I'm afraid not. It's the wonderful adventures of Mrs. Seacole in many lands. So uh, nine out of ten. Well done. That's a very strong score. But yeah, you you didn't quite get it at the end there. (sighs) Fallen at the last hurdle. Another great name for your autobiography, Nathan. Sorry. I mean, (laughs) (laughs) and thank you to Gretchen for informing you with all that lovely knowledge and listeners if you need more of nathan in your life then dig out our episode on notting hill carnival if you want to learn more about healthcare, of course in the past you can check out our episode on ancient greek and roman medicine and remember if you've had a laugh and if you've learned some stuff please do share the podcast with your friends leave a review online subscribe to your dead to me on bbc sounds so you never miss an episode so all that's left really for me to do is say a big thank you to my guests in history corner We've had the exceptional Professor Gretchen Gazina from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Thank you, Gretchen. Thank you, Greg. It was really, really fun. And in Comedy Corner, we've had the brilliant Nathan Caton. Cheers, Nathan. Uh, thank you for having me. And I apologise again for that last question. Ah, oh, it's going to bug me. <laughs> and to you, lovely listener, join me next time as we give another historical subject the You're Dead to Me treatment. But for now, I'm off to go and practice podcasting on my daughter's dolls. Bye! <laughs> You're Dead to Me was a production by The Athletic for BBC Radio 4. The research was by Hannah McKenzie. The script was by Emma Nagoose and me. The project manager was Cypher Mio. And the producer was Cornelius Mendes. From the makers of the Battersea Poltergeist, a new podcast series for BBC Radio 4. Uncanny. Do you believe in ghosts? No. Have you seen one? Yes. Real life stories of the supernatural, told by the people they happen to. Presented by me, Danny Robbins. There was a very strong sense of pure evil. Subscribe to Uncanny on BBC Sounds.